Uh, all right, it is time for Mike Unleashed. I got a lot of stuff in Mike Unleashed today. So uh, let's get right to it. And let's first start with the tragedy that happened uh, with the New England Patriots fan when he was punched by a Miami uh, Dolphin fan, wound up dying. Now, I know, Darren, you're personally involved with this story, sort of, but let, let me just give you a backdrop on this ridiculousness. I am so tired of these squabbles of football games when people are sticking up for their team. Like, what, what, are, you, what are we, 14 years old here? We're, we're adult grown people, right? Is your fandom that, like, crazy that you're going to have to fight somebody over it? Grow the F up for crying out loud. This happens too damn much where you're defending your team against a fan that has the other team's jersey on. It's ridiculous now. Stop drinking, all right? Or at least curtail your drinking at a point where you still have some sanity. All right, now, Darren, what is your uh, your, your personal involvement with this case? Well, well, first of all, you're right. And I feel like every week there's a video of a stupid scuffle fight that breaks out. The other day, I think it was a, uh, a bear. I think it was Bears in the box, maybe, where a Bears fan was mouthing off and a guy was just like cold cocking him and cracking him while he was on the ground. It happens every week at a different stadium. It, it really, uh, it's become unruly. But the, the gentleman who passed away, his name was Dale, um, he is seated. I've, I have a close friend in the New England area who's had Patriots season tickets for 45 years. Friends with Dale. He actually has sat next to him for 30 years. He gave his tip. My buddy gave his tickets to his daughter and her boyfriend that night. And she was there. There were three Miami fans directly behind him, mouthing off drunk. He was drinking vodka out of a water bottle straight. And one Patriot fan stood up and he got in mouth off. He threw a punch at him. So this guy, Dale, who he's a big teddy bear trying to keep the peace, got up, turned around, tried to get everybody to calm down, and they got into a scuffle with him. Uh, One guy put him in a headlock and a chokehold, and then this kid who already hit somebody uppercut him and then like hammer slammed on the top of his head. My friend's daughter watched him slump down into the chair and just fall backwards. She said she literally watched him turn blue. Um, Her video, you know, it's just – that you videotaped the whole thing, which is one of the reasons I think this guy's going to go to jail for manslaughter easily. But it's just this is becoming a pattern um, in, in every stadium. It's not just New England. It's certainly, you know, it's doesn't really happen in Philly, though. You would think Philly fans would get uh, blamed for that. But I always see it at a different stadium. It's it's enough. I don't know if stadium security has to be beefed up a little bit more, um, but it's becoming far too common. This guy is a great guy, has a couple of kids. One of those like keep the peace teddy bear kind of guy and uh my friend was calling all night he didn't know that he had passed away yet finally got word from his wife in the middle of the night i I mean that's just it's an unimaginable way to to lose someone um so i and it's becoming too common all right let me uh shed some uh, legal light on this because uh there's some information that came out today that the guy actually died of a pre-existing health condition uh, now, if that is not in existence, it's a definite voluntary manslaughter charge in which that guy's go away for 10 years, the guy who threw the punch. Uh, if they could prove that it was a pre-existing and it was not actually the cause of death, this guy would get off the hook somewhat. I don't know if they would reduce the manslaughter charge. It could be involuntary manslaughter, but it's considerably less punishment than 10 years if it, if it goes to that. So that's the little tweak in the case at this point. But again, we go back to this nonsense where like you're so provincial, you got to protect your team against who? Somebody who roots for the other team? Grow to hell up. You're, you're adults. These are adults. These, you, these aren't children fighting. Be an adult. And if you can't handle your liquor, then be responsible. Have a friend curb your liquor intake. All right, let's move on. The second thing for Mike Unleashed today is the Mel Tucker situation at Michigan State. Now, let me get this straight. This guy signed a $70 million contract to be the head coach of Michigan State's football team. Uh, He gets uh, snarled in a sexual harassment case with a woman who was hired by the university to lecture against sexual harassment situations. It really is the most incredible irony you've ever heard of. Well, hold on a second. (laughs) He says... That that uh, he had uh, consensual phone sex with the with the woman. Now, uh, she says he uh, sexually harassed her over the phone. Here's the simple question that I ask. Uh, 
And I'm not trying to support Mel Tucker at all because I, I find it like I had the same feeling when Bill Clinton was in the White House skulking around having phone sex as the president of the United States with Monica Lewinsky. I'm going, what? Wait, do you have any more dignity than this at all? Can't you do your business with something else? You got to do it on a live telephone conversation with somebody who's been hired by the university to lecture against sexual harassment. But the question that pops into my mind is, if she's getting sexually harassed on the phone and he is having a good time with some kind of perversion, don't you have the option of hanging up the telephone? I mean, listen, I, I'm not I'm not the brightest bulb in the room, okay? But I'm thinking to myself, if that goes on, click. I mean, am I wrong? Think that's very easy. Does she have the option to hang up the phone? <laughs> All right, let's move on. I got a lot of blowback on my opinions on uh, Congressman John Fetterman because the because of him. Uh, the Democratic caucus approved uh, uh, a non-dress code situation. Um, I guess this is a conservative view of mine, but there are certain jobs, as I said last week, that um, where you should have a, a modicum of decorum. And to me, being a congressman is one of them. Is it that difficult to wear a dress shirt and pants? <laughs> like, forget it. Forget about the, the the sport coat or a tie. Like, well, what's the necessity that you have to look like some guy working in a barn? Like, like I don't understand that. Like, what what may, you you can't like what is it? You lower yourself. You can't put on a a dress shirt and pants. Like, I I don't get the whole mentality on why you have to wear a hoodie and shorts. Like, I don't get that whole thing. And I, I and, and listen, if you work in an office and they allow that, knock yourself out. I'm saying that there's a certain amount of jobs that you just shouldn't be able to do that. And one is to have respect for the office. That you were elected to. Now, I ask people that, that well, Mike, you're just all fine. Well, I don't know how that affects his job. Well, let me ask you this. When a lawyer goes into a courtroom, can he go in there with a hoodie and shorts? No. You're supposed to have a modicum of decorum when you go into a courtroom in front of a judge. There are certain jobs that allow you or that, 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 that really kind of make it mandatory for you to do that. I, I, I get rankled when I see people going to church just like they're Mr. Green Jeans. Like, like, I don't understand it. Wait, put on something nice. It's the house, the house of God that you worship the God. Now, I particularly don't go to church, but I've seen people that go to church. What, what do you, why do you have to go as a slob? I don't understand it. Like, what is it that much of a hardship to dress up every now and then? All right. It's enough of that. Uh, there's a golf video that's going viral. I don't know if you've so, you've seen this, right? And and the golf video that you, you should see is whether the the team has a four or a five. Uh, now, if, 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 did you see this, Darren? Uh, I I didn't watch the video, but did I did see, see that pass by. I... Okay, supposedly these guys are in a scramble, yeah. I, which I which I don't understand. How can they be in a scramble and care about this? Because in a scramble, all right. So here's the situation: the, the one guy on the team misses his par putt. And he's about two and a half feet away, and he taps it in and says, all right, we got five, meaning his partner now has the putt for par. The people in the foursome, and I don't know why, because if you're in a scramble, you're on the same team. So I don't know why the other two people w would have anything to say at all, but they go, no, 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 no that, that's, you can't be in for five. Here's, here's what, if it's a match and not a scramble, here's what should happen. If you miss the putt, your partner then has a chance to make par. But you can't tap that in at that point unless the guys you're playing with concede that putt. The decorum is you mark the ball after you miss the par putt. You're two and a half feet away, you mark the ball. Now your partner has a chance to make par, which, by the way, he did in this video. So that goes down as a four, right? So, but, so I, I don't understand. I need more information on this whole thing. The, the rule is clear. You, you, you can't just knock the ball in and say that's that's five because then the other people say, OK, well, you take five on that hole then. I, I don't understand it. You mark the ball. So this doesn't come into play. If your partner misses the par putt, then they concede the five or you just knock it in from that point on to make five. So I don't understand what this dilemma is all about. In a scramble, it shouldn't matter. You're all on the same team trying to get the best score possible. But I so my sense is it was some kind of a match. And in a match, yeah, 
The other guy says, no, 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 hold it. You mark that ball. <laughs> right? That's, that's what you do. Unless the guy goes, all right, that's good. So I, I don't know what, what, the, what the situation there was. All right. Uh, let's move on. Phil Sellers died. Now, Darren, you have no idea who Phil Sellers is. Uh, at the is. moment, no. He's an all-time Rutgers University basketball player. Okay. And, and the reason why this is notable to me is because in the 1975-76 season, Rutgers went undefeated and made it to the Final Four. And as a, as a younger Mikey Miss, as a basketball college basketball fan, that team was my favorite team. I latched onto that team, and I could. And I want you to do a checkup here because my brain. This is how my brain works. This is a long time ago now. Seventy five, seventy six. I can still tell you the starting Rutgers team. They broke my heart because they lost the first game in the Final Four. I thought they were going to win the national championship, but that was my favorite team to the point where I was so enamored with that team that. Rutgers was actually my first choice of college. Yeah. So here, are, here is the Rutgers starting lineup. You can check. 75-76. Darren, you got a computer in front of you? 75-76. Right now, I got it in front of me. Rutgers, all right. Here's on, the, on, here's the starting the team because one of the starting point guard happened yep. to be a, a former 76ers head coach. The starting point guard of that team was Eddie Jordan. Yeah, there he is. Got it. The, the yep. two guard. The two guard was Mike Got Gavney. Yep. The, the center was a freshman named James yeah. Bailey. They called him Jumping yep. James Bailey. <laughs> the forward was from Trenton, New Jersey, Hollis Copeland. Uh, yeah, got it. Yep. <laughs> and the, the other starting forward Phil was the Sellers. great Phil Sellers, who was Rutgers' all-time leading scorer. He died of a stroke a couple of days ago. He never really made it in the NBA. Had a cup of coffee in the NBA, but he was a great college basketball player. The Rutgers team was seventy-five, seventy-six. Went to the Final Four, and Mikey Miss was in on That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Finally, we'll close out Mike Unleashed with this. I don't know how you feel about this, but McDonald's has brought back the spicy uh, nugget. Don't do McDonald's. Don't, I don't do McDonald's. I do uh... the spicy McNugget. Uh, are you are you a fan of the spice? Are you a fan of the McNugget? I'll have a McNugget. Yeah, but I usually it's usually you a Chick Fil A McNugget in my house. <laughs> I'm talking about a McDonald's. Yeah, McNugget. no, I, I like a McNugget. You do. Yeah. There's nothing crappier. It's awful. Than a McNugget. I know, but I'll enjoy it. I, I, I don't know how they, what kind of chicken they grind up and, and, and make that out of, but it's disgusting. However, when we're talking about McNuggets, uh, it always brings to mind a scene from my favorite show ever, which I think is the best show ever made, The Wire, where D'Angelo Barksdale is explaining to his underlings about the economics of the person who invented the McNugget. If you've never seen The Wire, you can go on YouTube, type in D'Angelo Barksdale Chicken McNuggets, and you'll find it. And it is absolutely <laughs> hysterical. All right? Okay, that does it for Mike Unleashed today. We're going to start a new feature today, Darren, and it's called Mike's Week of Tweets. <laughs> now, you know, I, I love uh, uh, putting twi Twitter out or whatever it's called, X. And uh, I have a lot of fun because I'm very sarcastic. I actually think I'm really good at it. All right. So, so I put out you like to these poke sarcastic people. tweets. You like to poke and jab time. people. So I get it. <laughs> right. I do poke and jab people. I love it. And when people get rude with me, I, I, take, I don't know why this. I take absolute delight <laughs> in, in stabbing them back and then block I've them. noticed you'll go after a guy who's got like four followers, no picture. I'm like, this guy, it's my own even a human. And you're going I, I love dismissing idiots from my life. <laughs> so I'll, I'll throw a jab back and then I'll block him. And it gives me the ultimate satisfaction. It's really weird. It's probably uh, some psychological disorder that I have, which I'm willing That's to possible. address at any yeah. particular time. But um, all right. So this is what I tweeted. And I'll just go from current to, to backwards. So uh, I tweeted last yesterday after the Phillies win. Well, Phillies win today, take two or three, at least has to make the Braves think, in caps, a little bit on the playoffs. No? Okay. My next tweet was about Sage Steele. You know, Sage Steele is a rabid right winger and uh, left ESPN and then trashed ESPN and, and blah, blah, blah. I gave you the backstory on Sage Steele. 
So uh, she announced that she is driving the pace car at the NASCAR race Sunday in Texas. Dying can't wait. I tweeted, but wait, doesn't she know she can only make left turns? <laughs> That's a dad. Rate the tweet, that, Darren. Rate that's, it. That's a dad joke right there. Uh, yeah, it's it's a swing and a miss. You don't like swing it. and a miss. Yeah. Swing and a miss. <laughs> yeah. oh my God, I thought that was a stare. That's pretty. It's a, nah, it's, it's, you uh, miss. it's a swing uh, and a miss. Okay. Uh, let's see <laughs> what tough. else. Uh, oh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> I'll go back in time with Lauren oh, Bober. Uh, Lauren Bober, of course, who had her boobies fondled. And grabbed the guy's joint uh, in a musical called Beetlejuice in Denver and is now taking a wrath of crap about it. She actually uh, uh, is trying to justify it by saying it, that uh, she'll never date a Democrat again and blah, 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 blah. The hell does that happen? And to uh, do so uh, I, I posted <laughs> I posted her video and I, I said, you're a cheap putan. Get back to pouring <laughs> domestic drafts. <laughs> she's, she's the worst. You the like worst, that one? That woman. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and finally, there was a video that went viral about this guy. His name's David Johnson, a 48-year-old man from Nashville, Tennessee. On Monday, he apparently didn't like the fact that a man of Honduran des- uh, descent was running a fruit stand in his neighborhood. So he approached a man and completely destroyed his fruit stand. Threw fruit all over the place, got picked up the table and smashed it near the road. And uh, so I tweeted just two words. Jerk off. Rate that tweet. Yeah, he it's, and it's accurate. Good tweet, accurate, quick to the point. All right. Thank you very much. Didn't like my stage steal. I thought it was brilliant. That'll close it down for today. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening to the podcast. We're having great success with it, and that's because you guys are actually clicking on it, watching it, listening to it. We really appreciate it. Just spread the word of the Mike Masnelli podcast because uh, we're going great guns right now. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. It's going to be a nice weekend. Today I'm playing golf, actually with Seth Joyner. So we'll see how that goes. And, uh, uh, of course, the Eagles game on Monday night, which means we will be doing our podcast post-game on Tuesday. So stay tuned for that. Have a great weekend, everybody. This is Mike Masnelli. And uh, to echo the words of the great Steve Fredericks, see ya.